I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, and welcome to Mater and Magistra, a show dedicated to studying the Catholic Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and delving into the riches of the sacred deposit of the faith. My name is Jason Brunel, and I will be with you this evening from 8 o'clock or from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock, um, discussing the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So, uh, we should begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle them with the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the same Holy Spirit, grant that we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray, and our Father, a Hail Mary, and the glory be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of of thy womb, Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. And I put this, put the show on speaker so I can freely navigate my, uh, my catechism, uh, the catechism that I have at hand. Um, we are actually now finally moving into the part, the section of the catechism that speaks specifically about the process of the transmission of divine revelation. And this is, um, if the, the copy of the catechism that I am using is the image double day version. It is a small, uh, a small um, paper bound copy. It's the, um, it is the, I believe it's the first edition. Uh, so it's not the second new edition. It is the, it is the first edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, so um, we're uh, under Article 2, the Transmission of Divine Revelation. In paragraph 74, it reads, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth that is, of Christ Jesus. Christ must be proclaimed to all the nations and individuals so that this revelation may reach to the ends of the earth. God graciously arranged that the things he had once revealed for the salvation of all peoples should remain in their entirety throughout the ages and be transmitted to all future generations. Christ, uh, now this is under the apostolic tradition, uh, paragraph 75, Christ the Lord, in whom the entire revelation of the Most High God is summed up, commanded the apostles to preach the gospel, which had been promised beforehand by the prophets, 
and which he fulfilled in his own person and promulgated with his own lips. In preaching the gospel, they were to communicate the gifts of God to all men. This gospel was to be the source of all saving truth and moral discipline in apostolic preaching. Uh, paragraph 76. In keeping with the Lord's command, the gospel was handed on in two ways then. The first way was orally, by the apostles who handed on, by the spoken word of their preaching, by the example they gave, by the institutions they established, uh, what they themselves had received, whether from the lips of Christ, from his way of life and his works, or whether they had learned it at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And the second way, as opposed to orally, was in writing. That is, by those apostles and other men associated with the apostles who, under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit, committed the message of salvation to writing. So, moving on to paragraph 77. Continued in apostolic succession in order that the full and living gospel might always be preserved in the, in the church, the apostles left bishops as their successors. They gave them their own position of teaching authority. Indeed, the apostolic preaching, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved in a continuous line of succession until the end of time. This living transmission accomplished in the Holy Spirit is called tradition since it is distinct from sacred scripture though closely connected to it. Again, this living transmission accomplished in the Holy Spirit is called tradition with a capital T since it is distinct from the sacred scripture though very closely connected to it. Through sacred tradition, quote, the church in her doctrine life and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. The sayings of the Holy Fathers are a witness to the life-giving presence of this sacred tradition showing how its riches are poured out in the practice and life of the church, in her belief and, and in her prayer. The Father's self-communication made through his word in the Holy Spirit remains present and active in the church. God, who spoke in the past, continues to converse with the spouse of his beloved Son, the church, and the Holy Spirit, through whom the living voice of the gospel rings out in the church and through her in the world, leads believers to the full truth and makes the word of Christ dwell in them in all its richness. So this is really uh, the the beginning of um, uh, the the two uh, origins uh, the the or, the oral tradition and the written tradition. Um, clearly, the written tradition is a uh, is an outgrowth of the oral tradition, um, and we're also going to get into the distinction between uh, tradition and scripture uh, in this next section. Um, uh, in the paragraph 80, one common source. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture, then, are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them, flowing out of the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing, one entity, and move towards the same goal. Each of them makes present the, fruit, the fruitful in the church, the I'm sorry, each of them makes present and fruitful in the church the mystery of Christ, who promised to remain with his own always to the very close of the age. Two distinct modes of transmission. Paragraph 81. Sacred scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And holy or sacred tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that, enlightened by the Spirit of Truth, the very same Holy Spirit that, that inspired the apostles, uh, 
that they might faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. As a result, the church, to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone, but rather sacred but rather, scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Um, this is very, very important uh, because, um, okay, so we have, we have the, the twinfold source of revelation um, being sacred scripture and sacred, sacred scripture and sacred tradition. You um, have uh, scripture we believe that scripture is inspired and is inerrant uh, with, with regard to its teach. Every, everything that is contained in sacred scripture uh, is, is, and we're going to get into this, you know, more, but, but using a philosophical axiom uh, that I've used in the past in this show, a cause cannot be I'm sorry, an effect cannot be greater than its cause. That's a philosophical axiom. An effect cannot be greater than its cause. And so there is this, this notion uh, when the Protestant Reformation uh, took hold, uh, there was this rejection of, of, um, of the Pope and of, of the, of the uh, a, a, a very clear uh, rejection of the very concept of sacred tradition. And hence the concept of sola scriptura uh, became very, very prominent and very popular uh, amongst, the, amongst certain Protestant sects uh, who, who really felt that the Catholic, the, 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 the clerics, uh, the, the bishops, the cardinals, the priests, and particularly the Pope, uh, were uh, teaching things that were not found in Scripture and had gone above and beyond. And, and so they, they felt the need to reform and purify what they believed to be. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting because if you really, uh, truly brilliant theologians, individuals like Scott Hahn, um, if you pick up a book by Scott Hahn, such as, uh, a Father Who Keeps His Promises. What a, what a marvelous book that is. I encourage all of my, re- my, all of my readers and uh, 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 listeners to pick that book up. Um, it really just brings you through sacred scripture in, in such a way as to open your eyes to see the connections, to make the connections, to really understand how incredibly, how incredibly Perfect, sacred scripture is, and and um, and 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 we 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 also and, and Scott Hahn the, the the beauty of Scott Hahn is that um, as a convert to the faith he he really he he began his academic well his he he began he set out to basically debunk the Catholic Church his his, his goal was to very clearly and concisely show using uh, the the writings of the early church fathers uh, and and you know uh, any number of sources that he could find how the Catholic Church had deviated from its original from the original pure Christianity uh, that was set forth by Christ in the Gospels uh, and th- that was his whole mission and purpose. Um, and in the process of attempting to do just that, he was finding and accumulating evidence that led him to the conviction that every single thing he came up with pointed to the Catholic Church uh, expressing precisely what Christ states in Scripture. Every, theo- every early church theologian, every early church father, uh, St. Augustine, St. Irenaeus, St. Athanasius, um, uh, Eusebius, all these early church fathers were saying things that were underscoring 
everything that the Catholic Church had been saying for the past 2,000 years. Um, and he had a, a really, he had really had a breakthrough uh, moment when uh, he was working with a, a, a group uh, doing scripture studies, leading a scripture study, and there was a Catholic in his group. And th- this, this Catholic had um, left the Catholic Church to probably to find uh, more community. Uh, that's, I do have to say that is one of the things that we as Catholics really have to learn. And I do believe that that's part of, at least part of the reason why God in his, in his uh, providence has permitted this, um, this disunity to occur. He has permitted, uh, you know, we've, we've spoken in the past about the whole concept of, of, of evil and if God is all good and all powerful, how is it that evil, you know, how is it that, that uh, evil is a reality? Um, but we, we, we understand that. We, we talked about the, the, the reality of, um, of, of, of evil as a privation. It's the lack of something that ought to be present, uh, namely goodness, virtue. Um, So God has a plan, and God would not permit something that is evil if he were not not going to bring a greater good out of it. Um, Everything, every single thing that God permits and that is a part of his plan – well, ultimately, and as 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 Saint Paul beautifully states, for those who love God, all things work together unto the good, and that is the truth. That is the absolute truth. So even our sinfulness, even our brokenness, even our and how many times have we read uh, Saint Paul? Uh, he talks about uh, being given a, a thorn in the flesh, uh, an angel of Satan to to bother him and to. Uh, some some type of there was some it, Saint Paul doesn't make it clear what type of sin it was, but there was something, some some type of sin. Uh, it sounded like a habitual sin, and Saint Paul states that three times he begged the Lord to remove this thing from his life, whatever it was, and eventually it was given to him to understand that. Um, or God's response to St. Paul was, my grace alone is sufficient. And the reality that, that God's power is made perfect in our human weakness was a truth that was given to St. Paul to understand and to communicate to us that it is precisely in our weakness it is precisely in our brokenness that God's power is made perfect. Uh, if you look at the various apparitions of Our Lady, um, of course, we're not bound to believe them. They are, of course, not a part of the public uh, d- sacred deposit of faith, um, but they are tremendous gifts from God uh, if they are indeed approved by the Church, provided that they teach nothing that is contrary to the faith, uh, no private revelation, no, no authentic private revelation will ever teach anything that is contrary to the truth of our holy Catholic faith. Uh, if it is authentic, it will underscore some aspect of the faith that God is trying to raise awareness of amongst his people. So the whole reason for private revelations is to get people's attention with regard to a specific article of the faith. Um, it is my particular belief that the most recent, that many if not all of the most recent Marian, uh, approved Marian uh, private revelations have to do with the great apostasy that we are facing, the, the widespread loss of and rejection of the the true faith and that uh, basically our lady is coming to earth to to remind human beings that god you know despite your efforts to create a civilization without god um he does exist uh and 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 you are uh you know in this in your effort to create a civilization without god 
this is this is really really um, uh, fanning the flames of, of you know God's anger is burning hot, and and um, and but His mercy is infinite. His His God that that's that's the beautiful message that we have from uh, again another private revelation given to. Uh, a canonized saint of the church, uh, Saint Faustina, uh, whose whose many diaries were compiled into one and are now available. I highly, highly recommend it's th- that that the, the diary of Sister Faustina. Um, it is incredible. Uh, the, the the message is so beautiful, and essentially the, the Jesus Jesus stated. Even though your sins be as scarlet, um, you know, just to have recourse to the tremendous fountain of divine mercy that is the sacrament of reconciliation, go wash at the fountain. And Our Lady's, uh, Our Lady's apparitions at Lourdes really underscore that whole reality where Bernadette started to dig. People thought she was mad, out of her mind. Here she is dropping to her knees, claiming to have visions that nobody else can see, and digging in the, digging in the dirt. Uh, they, they really thought she lost her mind, that she was crazy. And lo and behold, water. And this was this was an area where there was no water whatsoever, and she was just told by Our Lady to start digging at this particular spot. And from this little, from these, I mean, you can only you can imagine what a, a, a girl as young as Bernadette Subaru was when she was when she received the apparitions that she did from Our Lady. Uh, a small little girl with her tiny little hands digging in the dirt. I mean, how far could she have gotten? And and yet water started to well up and became this force to such an extent that there are rivers. There's a river of water that flows that that enable and it's it's so it's so prominent, it's so large, it's so forceful that people can actually they they set up this whole thing around it. It became a a, a, a this, this torrent of water, and they the, the waters are truly miraculous. People wash in these waters and are healed. And there have been more reports of healings taking place by people who bathe. They, they actually allow uh, crippled individuals, individuals, particularly individuals who are in wheelchairs, they lift them out of the wheelchairs. And there are people who, who volunteer and donate their time doing this, uh, nurses who will lift people out of their wheelchairs and place them in these baths, they're literally baths that are that are that are filled up with water from this grotto, this this flowing fountain of water uh, that that came into existence at the behest of Our Lady's uh, uh, instruction to Bernadette to just start digging in the dirt, and and people are cured of every disease and ailment you can possibly conceive of. It's amazing, but how how symbolic is that? of the of the cleansing that is available to us spiritually in the sacrament of reconciliation that we can go and wash in the living waters the water the blood in the water that gushes forth from the heart of Jesus is a fountain of divine mercy for us and that beautiful devotion of divine mercy and that beautiful reality that we can be washed entirely of our sins and cleansed and purified not through anything not through any good deed of our own uh, not you know God forbid we ever think oh yeah I went to confession and uh, I got my sins forgiven and I did all this and and we somehow take credit for it that's perverse that is truly perverse um, and yet that is where our minds go because we are broken, sinful humans, uh, we 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 need to we need to continually meditate on the gospel. We need to continually meditate on the gospel to and, and, and one of the best and easiest ways of doing that is by praying the rosary daily. 
praying the rosary is nothing other than a meditation on the life, the, the joyful mysteries, the public mysteries, the sorrowful mysteries, and the glorious mysteries of the life of our Lord and Our Lady and, and how they apply to our lives and how we can relate or how we can kind of compare what we're going through to what our Lord went through, uh, compare what we're experiencing to what our Lord was experiencing, what Our Lady ex- was experiencing. Um, John Paul II states about the rosary, it, it really beats the rhythm of human life. Um, um, it, it really does, but I ended up straying off track. Um, I would like to return to the distinct modes, the two distinct modes of transmission of um, uh, of the tr- transmission of sacred tradition. We have, um, where, let's see where I left off. I believe it was on um, 82. Scripture and tradition are to be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. I, I began talking about the... Um, the whole Protestant Reformation and the rejection of the, the Pope, the rejection of sacred tradition, uh, a complete rejection of sacred tradition that, and, and, and a, an adoption of the notion of, of sola scriptura, scripture alone, that scripture alone uh, should be, uh, that, that every individual uh, should have the right to the the right and the ability to interpret the sacred scripture as he or she is moved to by the Holy Spirit. Um, now there is, uh, I, I I would never go so far as to say that that I would never I would never say that we should not read the sacred scripture. That would be crazy, but but it, it is very very important that we understand that. In order to best understand, in order to best understand sacred scripture, when we are reading it privately or publicly, uh, when we are studying it in a in a scripture study in a group, um, it is imperative that we take into consideration what the church, what the holy magisterium, has stated uh, with regard to any particular scripture passage. And um, that is why there are uh, various study Bibles that come equipped. Um, they come with various passages that have, where where biblical where theologians, uh, um, particularly scripture scholars like Scott Hahn um, and other brilliant scripture scholars, uh, will uh, I know Scott Hahn and um, I believe Mitch Curtis uh, together uh, uh, wrote the, um, uh, they together worked on the, the Ignatius Study Bible, uh, the, the revised, the RSV CE, uh, the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition. And um, uh, Ignatius Press uh, employed uh, Scott Hahn, uh, who is tr- truly a, just a brilliant biblical scholar, and 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 uh, an, another uh, very erudite individual to uh, provide the the theological commentary um, for every single passage throughout the entire for the entirety of of the New Testament, and it, it is really a powerhouse. I cannot recommend it uh, more highly. Uh, the, it is the Revised Standard Version, second edition of the Ignatius Study Bible, and it is uh, uh, the, the theological um, commentary done by Scott Hahn, Dr. Scott Hahn, who is Professor of Biblical Theology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and um, is world-renowned for his uh, truly... Uh, his, not only his brilliant theological mind uh, and, and, his, and his mastery of sacred scripture and, and particularly covenant theology, um, um, using the theme of, of covenant 
as the kind of the Rosetta Stone to really understand all of sacred scripture, but but also his ability to bring it down to a level where it is truly understandable to all persons, uh, regardless of their previous education, regardless of their background, without watering down anything. Um, that's that's a that's a masterful ability to to bring complex realities down to a level that makes them understandable to the masses without watering down whatever it is that, that, that you're attempting to explain, especially when, when what it is that you are trying to explain is inherently uh, uh, difficult to understand. Um, so it's, it's, it's really beautiful what he, w- what he has been capable of doing in this particular book and in all of his books, really. Um, so to pick up um, paragraph 83, the tradition here in question, um, I'm just going to reread paragraph 82. As a, result of the, um, as a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted, quote, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Now, I know that oftentimes you go into a home and you will see a, a, a scripture in a prominent place, uh, maybe on, on a wooden stand. Um, and um, if, if you go to a Catholic home, it's usually covered with about an inch of dust. <laughs> <laughs> Catholics are notorious for not reading sacred scripture. Um, they just kind of lie back and, and let the priest do it for them, as it were. Uh, but that's, that, is, that cannot stand people. We cannot allow that to happen. Um, we cannot simply sit back and, and, and let the church explain, you know, do all the hard work for us, as it were, and then, and then kind of spoon feed us every Sunday with a, with a little a little bit here and a little bit there, and eventually we'll get the whole thing. It's, that's not how it works. It's not how it should work anyway. It, it, it's, a lot of people do take that approach, sadly. But that is not what we're... We should be reading Scripture every single day. And I'm not just saying, you know, within the context of, of Mass or whatever, but really reading Scripture. A, a wonderful way of reading Scripture without even really trying to do so, is by going and participating in daily Mass and also by taking up the wonderful habit of, of praying the official prayer of the Church, which is the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, it's, it actually has many names, the Liturgy of the Hours, the book itself, or the compilation of books, uh, sometimes called the four-volume breviary. Uh, then you have the one-volume Christian prayer, um, which essentially is the same thing. These are all the same thing. Um, Liturgy of the Hours, the four-volume breviary, uh, the one-volume Christian prayer. Um, there's another volume called, it's a, it's a smaller version of, it's, it, they, they shrunk the four volumes down into one volume and called that Christian prayer. Then they took that, a few, just a few, maybe you've, 15, 20 years ago, and they came out with a, an even smaller version called Shorter Christian Prayer. And it's an even shorter book than the one volume. And I think, there's, I think they've gone a step further and have abbreviated it even further, but there's also uh, a, 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 a very significant abbreviation of the... Uh, of the well, it's, it's really not an abbreviation as much as it's a prayer-based on the Liturgy of the Hours, and it's called, it's, it's, it's put out in the form of a, I believe, a monthly subscription uh, called, a magazine called the Magnificat, and I know that many, there are many lay Catholics who really greatly enjoy the Magnificat because it does contain uh, selections from morning prayer uh, as it is found in, in the Liturgy of the Hours, selections from, from night prayer as it is found in the Liturgy of the Hours, um, as well as uh, probably the readings, the liturgical readings, 
um, the saint of the day, if there is one, um, whatever, whatever feast uh, or whatever solemnity or feast or memorial or optional memorial happens to be celebrated that day. So that's, those are all wonderful ways. But it is imperative that we honor and reverence not just sacred scripture, according to the catechism, but with equal reverence and devotion, we ought to honor with, with equal reverence, with equal sentiment, the sacred tradition of the Catholic Church. Now, it's pretty easy to, uh, when I say the word, you know, when I say scripture, or we think of a Bible, and we have an immediate idea of what sacred scripture is. Sacred tradition is much harder to define. Um, a sacred tradition, as I stated earlier in the catechism, uh, it is the... Let's see. How would I? How could I define it? Uh, well, right here in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, defi- it would define. It's, it, it states uh, in paragraph seventy-eight. Um, let's see. This living, tr- this living transmission accomplished in the Holy Spirit is called tradition. So it is a living transmission. Um, it is distinct from sacred scripture, although it is closely connected to it. And it is from this sacred tradition that sacred scripture emerged. Um, We can think of tradition with a capital T as 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 the cause. And we can think of sacred scripture as the effect that arose out of sacred tradition. Had there been, had, were it not for sacred tradition, there would be no sacred scripture. Um, so let us again try to really pin down a good definition for sacred scripture. Um, the living trans- tradition is the living transmission accomplished in the Holy Spirit, and that's why it's called living, because it is the Holy Spirit who is carrying this living tradition. It is distinct from sacred scripture, but closely connected to it in that it gives rise to sacred scripture. Um, Through sacred tradition, the church, in her doctrine, in her life, in her worship, perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is and all that she herself believes. So sacred tradition contains the entire deposit of the, the entire sacred deposit of the faith. Sacred tradition, um, the sacred liturgy is included in sacred tradition. Um, the entire life of the church, which can only take place uh, through the living action of the Holy Spirit of God is sacred tradition. Um, this, the, so everything the church believes, um, the church in her, in her doctrine, in her teaching, uh, this catechism that I'm holding in my hand is, is, a, is a beautiful example of of sacred tradition put in writing. Um, the docu- the, all, of the, all of the documents of the Second Vatican Council are beautiful examples of sacred tradition placed in writing, put down in writing. So it's, it's the entire life of the church, the entire doctrine of the church, the entire teaching of the church, and it is a living tradition. It is a tradition that is alive precisely because the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the church and is preserving. Now, it is the purpose of the magisterium. The the magisterium comes from the word magistra, which is the name, a part of the name of this show, mater et magistra, means mother and teacher. And so when when I refer to, when I say mater et magistra, 
I'm referring to my mother and my teacher, and uh, I am referring to, to two individual realities which are very interconnected. Um, I'm referring to the church, uh, who is my mother and my teacher, and I'm also referring to the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is my mother and my teacher. And Mary is the mother of the church. And so, and, and this is a really wonderful thing. Basically, anything, and you can try this out on your own, but anything that can be predicated of the Blessed Virgin Mary may also be predicated of the church and vice versa. So if you can say something about Mary, you can say it of the church. If you can say something truthful about the church, you can say the same thing about Mary. Uh, for instance, um, Mary gave birth to Christ. Mary gives birth to Christ. The church gave birth to Christ, and the church continues to give birth to Christ every time uh, the Mass is celebrated. The, the, the Holy Eucharist is made present, and the church gives birth to Christ. Um, the church, church gives birth to Christ in souls through the administration of the sacrament of baptism. Um, so that's just one example. Another example, um, uh, let's see. From an eschatological perspective, that is to say, looking, toward, looking, looking down the road into the future at the, uh, toward the end of time, uh, the church will be without spot or wrinkle uh, and, uh, in imitation of Mary, who is the mother of the church, who is already without the least stain of sin and is wholly without spot or wrinkle. So again, and, and really this... This, this whole concept that whatever you can say of the church, whatever can be predicated of the church, can also be predicated of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, and it's a, it's a really beautiful reality. But, um, so that, that is what tradition is. Now, it is clear based on that definition of, tr of tradition as the fullness of everything that the church believes the fullness of the sacramental life of the church, the reality of apostolic succession, which is the, the continuous laying on of hands uh, that, that, that stretches back to Christ himself who commissioned his, his uh, 12 uh, apostles, who in turn uh, chose successors for themselves, and Peter, of course, um, uh, also chose a successor, and Peter was the, uh, the 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 greatest among. So there were there were the the original twelve. Of course, we're not talking about Judas Iscariot, who betrayed our Lord, and our Lord had some serious words to say about him that uh, better for him to not have better for him uh, who betrayed the Lord to never have been born than to have done what he did. And I cannot help but to believe that even though the church has never officially declared anyone to be in hell, I think Christ himself declared Judas Iscariot to be in hell with those words. Um, better to never have been born. Um, if there is even, even if, even if you're going to be in purgatory for what is the equivalent of the longest possible time frame, even if you're going to receive the equivalent of what is the most profound, most intense, most overwhelming punishment um, aside from eternal damnation, the only thing, the only way our Lord could have said it better for him to never have been born is if the Lord knew that he had lost the possibility of salvation. That is the only reason it would ever be better for anyone to never have been born in the first place. That is the only reason I can possibly conceive of. If someone else can come up with something to... Uh, if someone, if, actually, I'm going to encourage uh, calls. Um, by all means, if you're listening to this uh, broadcast... Um, you are 
uh, part of the resistance in terms of resisting the ways of the world uh, and uh, resisting the, the secular mentality that would have us do without God. Um, I've been reading a lot about this growing movement of the socialist Democrats of America and how it's just very, very frightening. Um, a lot of crazy things happening in the world today, especially in the United States of America. Um, but what I would like to do is to encourage uh, my listeners to call into the station. Uh, the thing is, I need to get the phone number for this to happen. So let me f- see if I can find that phone number. If you could just bear with me, I would be so grateful. No, well, that's certainly not it. Radio. Try that. And here it is, WCAT Radio. Okay, so I encourage you, you can, it's, the number is right there, um, 515-604-9344. I I absolutely encourage you to call in with your questions, with your comments, uh, anything you'd like to talk about whatsoever, even if it's completely off topic. And when you call in, again, the number is 515-604-9344. You can use the access code 914121. That's 515-604-9344. 9344. So 94144. Okay. 914121 is the access code. Now, I'm going to bring this back upstairs into the office. So I've given a definition of tradition. And it is very easy to see how there, there literally could not be a scripture without tradition. It is quite impossible that scripture should exist without there being a sacred capital T tradition. Now, why do I say capital T? What's, what, what's, what's that about? <coughs> Please excuse me. The capital T refers to or I should say, is in opposition or as opposed to small t, uh, small t traditions, which are, which are human traditions which can be changed. Um, and that is precisely what occurred at the Second Vatican Council with regard to the sacred liturgy. Uh, there were, uh, now, if, if we understand that there are many different rites in the church. And the Roman rite, the, the, the Latin Roman rite is but one rite of the, of the church. And there are many uh, valid forms, many valid liturgies uh, where, the, where, the, where the priest is indeed confecting the Holy Eucharist and uh, where the sacraments uh, are authentic and true sacraments, and the priest has authentically been ordained uh, as a true presbyter of the Catholic Church and has the ability and the authority to, 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 to celebrate the Holy Eucharist, the Eucharistic liturgy, and to hear uh, confessions and to absolve individuals in persona Christi um, and, and to perform all seven sacraments. And these distinct, uh, these, these different churches are under the jurisdiction of Rome rec- and recognize the Pope as their visible head. Um, these, these Eastern Catholic churches, um, unlike the, the Roman Latin Rite, uh, have patriarchs. Uh, we do not have patriarchs in the, in the Roman Rite, in the Latin Rite. We do not have patriarchs, but we do have uh, cardinals. Uh, cardinals 
really uh, archbishop is really the highest you can uh, the highest uh, after uh, bishop archbishop usually an art once a man is made an archbishop it is very common that he is also elevated to the to to the level of cardinal uh, a cardinal is simply uh, a man who is is an elector a, a man who has to to the official function of a cardinal is to elect the pope um, but uh, well, on that note, it's, it's about uh, time to wrap up the show, so I'd like to thank you very much for listening this evening as we talked about the distinction between uh, uh, tradition and scripture. We will pick up on this distinction next week, and um, may the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. I thank you, God bless, and good night. We hope you enjoyed the program. And will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.